Hello. Uh, so I'm uh, somebody who makes stuff, and I work with um, electronics and textiles. And in particular, I um, uh, enjoy kind of mixing and meshing the processes coming from both crafts and engineering and um, bringing them together. And so because I involve electronics in my work, I've been much more involved in the open hardware community, and I'm quite new to the open design uh, movement. Um, and I'm actually quite excited about it, because from hearing some of the things that even were just came up in uh, Massimo's talk, the fact that there's a conversation going on about tacit knowledge and how to uh, even document and capture and share that kind of uh, information. Because in the open hardware community, so sharing circuit diagrams and electronics uh, parts lists, you can use GitHub, and, and I share my code and my uh, circuit diagrams there, but I'm always uh, end up having to find other ways to share all the other parts of the process of making if I want to make my designs accessible. Um, exactly, because in, in part what I'm interested in electronics is really getting away from all that standardization, so not having to have a standard parts list because you can make the parts yourself. Um, and when I present my work, I don't normally present it in this context. I'm normally talking about the uh, technologies that I develop and make with textiles and electronics. So this is the first time for me to start to reflect on my work in terms of how, it's, how I'm contributing to this community and, and, and why I, I, I do so. And I, I think it's important. So uh, I thought I'd start off my talk with one project that was my first project working with the kind of design process of textile and electronics and show how uh, documenting it led to then uh, a different, uh, a rethinking of uh, how best to share my work so that it would inspire and encourage other people to reproduce it. So the first project that I did was inspired by uh, a desire for a back massage. I was, um, and I should also say, so a lot of the work I'll be showing is done uh, in collaboration with Mika Satomi. We've been collaborating together since 2006. So this was our first project called Massage Me. And it was basically uh, a wearable interface for playing PlayStation games. And you had to massage the person's back in order to play the game. <laughs> So it's a bit of a long video to explain what it does, but it's maybe also nice because it shows that we exhibited it a lot and a lot of people used it and people enjoyed it. It may be not the best back massage, but it, people really had fun playing. And um, when we made the project, one thing that we thought about was, what if people want to have one then, uh, as well? And we, we liked that idea. We wanted to make it accessible, but we also didn't want to think about uh, turning it into a product and trying to sell it. So um, instead, we decided we would uh, open source it. And, and in order to do so, we had to document it in very great detail. And so that we could tell people if they were like, oh, this is great, can I have one? 
we could say like, yes, and here are the instructions, you can make it yourself. So it turned into quite a big documentation with all the materials and parts you had to order and where you could get them from. Um, we uh, digitized the pattern, the sewing pattern for the jackets and the circuitry patterns. So here you can see a bit. Um, this is a screenshot from, we used the platform Instructables to kind of publish it and post all the documentation there. So we did all that, hoping that maybe somebody really would want it and make it themselves. Um, and then this is a screenshot of some of the comments from that Instructable. So people liked it. But on the other hand, nobody really asked any detailed questions about how was that connection made or nothing that was indicating somebody's actually uh, trying to make one for themselves. So for us, this Massage Me project was very much about getting what we wanted um, by having a need and then working out, and for the first time also for us, figuring out how can we use conductive fabrics to make soft buttons and um, hack electronics to make an interface that we wanted. Um, so we then, uh, like this idea of like getting what you want, that's kind of what it was about. Um, and in order to get what you want, so for other people to get what they want, not what, what we wanted, um, we, we started a website called How to Get What You Want, where we basically documented um, more kind of smaller parts of the project. So Massage Me, we documented like the exact how you make this uh, project. And here we kind of broke, started to break down our work and post like little tutorials on different things. Um, and in particular, a lot of the work we did was kind of exploring conductive materials and uh, traditional kind of craft, uh, textile craft processes like knitting and sewing uh, to make sensors so that you could capture kind of actions from the physical world through fabrics um, and digitize those uh, values so to make textile sensors. So this is just a video now showing uh, the kind of work that's documented on that website, the how to get what you want. So uh, we also have uh, kind of circuit illustrations um, and step-by-step -step making instructions and then videos that kind of document. So here you can see this is not a final project. These are just kind of little demos showing possibilities of what you might do with a, a this is a comparison right now between a commercial bend sensor on the left hand and a fabric bend sensor that you can make yourself and then also showing it works underwater. And for us, it was also nice because a lot of the work we do in realizing our projects doesn't end up in a final piece. And still, it's nice to find a way to share all those little prototypes that you make. And this is a little pressure sensitive pad um, made by stitching with conductive thread into neoprene. And then this is a, an idea uh, an example of a tilt sensor, so just simple, very simple design, and then a little setup just to demonstrate how it works, but not really implying what you might do with it. Um, and here, this is a crochet potentiometer, so similar to what you'd have in your stereo as a volume knob, um, except here there's a, a bead that you move along this resistive track, and then in the background, I often use like uh, software called processing to write little visualizations just to indicate um, that you can get a reading. This is a very rudimentary touchpad that requires you to wear a little cap on your finger to uh, complete the circuit. And I'm showing these examples because afterwards um, I'll introduce uh, a few projects that made use of some of this work. Um, the previous one was a pom-pom made with a resistive yarn that when you squeeze it, it becomes more conductive. And then this is the same yarn, so instead of squeezing it, you inflate a balloon inside of it and then just a little light on it. So the, the more stretched it is with the inflated balloon, the more power can flow and the brighter the light becomes. And actually there's sound on this video, maybe not. But it's nice because you hear the air coming out of the balloon and the light getting dimmer, it's a nice effect. But, yep. So those were just some examples of what we document on the website. And uh, again, I also still use Instructables. Um, and then I've picked this one uh, example out 
uh, of the, this tilt bracelet. So it's a very simple design. It's a, a metal bead strung on some conductive thread with some petals around the, uh, uh, or around it. And uh, when the bead swings and makes contact with them, it's basically a digital switch. And so this was uh, posted on Instructables, and then these were the comments that it got. Um, and I really liked the first one was, and there were a few more like this, like they, people didn't understand what it was for, but at the same time, not understanding what the point of it was inspired them to think about what they could use it for and uh, come up with uh, their own ideas, but also uh, got a lot more comments that were building on the design, trying to improve it, giving us suggestions back of how we could make it better. So in comparison to the Massage Me, a feedback which was just very positive but um, not very in, engaged. This was really nice. And so in preparing this talk, I kind of went online and I uh, just kind of through Google searched to see uh, what projects people might have made with some of the uh, sensor designs that we shared online. And I'm not sure that all of the things that I'm going to show really were inspired by our work or if uh, Although I did check to make sure they at least happened or were published after ours so that there was a possibility that they was inspired. This was done, uh, it's called I'm Blanky uh, by Studio N-1. It's, uh, and it's basically a whole array or a whole blanket covered in these tilt sensors. And they've, they've improved or they've changed the design. So instead of having to have six separate contacts for each petal, They've put little resistors in between, so they can just measure an analog value based on where the bead is. But then they've got a lot of them, and they're collecting all the data from all of them. And on the website, they say it's to monitor people when they move in their sleep, so I'm imagining you use it on your bed. And then on the bottom right-hand corner, there's a, they have a video online. But you see they've actually then got a, kind of a representation of the blanket in software, and when you shake and move the blanket, you can move the digital representation. And also, it's very beautifully done. And um, then this was another example, which was, I thought, also nice. This is done by someone at the Fab Lab uh, Vag in Amsterdam. And it's just re-documenting uh, a design for the tilt sensor that I did, which I also thought was very nice. People remake something, and in order to reshare it or, or share their uh, changes or uh, appropriations of it, they redocument it and share it, which was nice. And here, in particular, she's kind of, I like the way she's indicating, or he, uh, the positive and negative legs of the LED by making them different uh, shapes. And uh, another project that I found, so this wasn't in the video, but this was a design for a stroke sensor. So it's like a switch with conductive hair, so you can make fur, and when you stroke over it to interact with it, you're basically closing switches. Um, and this, they, they referenced back to our site, and this is actually how I found the project. Um, and, and what was nice here was that they did a whole study looking into picking up on our, our design. They started to look into different materials and also different aesthetic designs for this sensor. So at the bottom, there's a few of their prototypes. Um, they were interested in, sorry, uh, making a, they call it an, a kinetic garment. So they've got... Uh, a whole variety of uh, sensors that can be interacted with on the garment, and then they've got motors and I think some other forms of creating uh, kind of feedback. So they, they call it an ecosystem of uh, uh, kinetic interactions. But yeah, just to show like somebody then picked up on the design and uh, iterated some more and shared it back. And then this was another uh, project I found using this idea of a tilt sensor. And so the, some, uh, sorry, not tilt sensor, the stroke sensor, so some of their initial prototypes on the left here. And uh, these were actually three dresses, or this is one of three dresses that had been designed for an opera piece by uh, some students at the Art University in Bremen. And uh, I didn't quite understand uh, the, con the whole context of the piece, but you see in the video, you see someone kind of hugging the person wearing this dress, and why them interacting with the back of the person with these sensors. Um, they're able to hear parts of the opera through the garment. Um, and then this is just the last project that I was actually commissioned to do uh, from Ian Danforth. 
because he saw my instructable, um, that little square pad where I was pressing and showing that could get location and amount of pressure. So he's uh, building an open source robot, and for that robot he wanted an open source robot skin that, similar to human skin, can detect where you're pressing and how hard you're pressing. Um, so I worked on that, and in the picture you can just see, so it's built up of three layers, um, a, a kind of a row and column grid with a material in between that can sense pressure, and it had to be stretchy so it could fit nicely over the arm, and then I made a little visualization, just like a heat map, so you could tell where and how hard you're pressing. So, yeah, these, those are some examples of how publishing not finished projects, but kind of little bits and pieces um, of projects I had the experience was more inspiring to other people for what they could then use it for themselves because I also very rarely go online and find something and remake it exactly the way someone else has done it. Normally you're, you're going there and you're looking for parts of a solution or parts of a, or a problem that you have and you find it in, as a part of someone else's solution. Um, so a lot of the work I showed just now was also mostly textile and electronics. And uh, the title of my talk is also uh, titled A Kit of No Parts, but this was uh, uh, the title of my master's thesis where I decided I wanted to go away from textiles a bit and see does this same approach of combining crafts, um, other kinds of crafts and electronics also kind of result on more diverse forms of uh, materiality in, in electronics. So uh, the subtitle was Recipes for Materially Diverse, Functionally Transparent and Expressive Electronics. So, yeah, thinking also a bit about how when we st end up working in uh, kind of very standardized systems, the way I feel electronics is, is gone, uh, the outcome is always has a lot of similarities. So everything that has a screen, is sc screen's always square, and buttons are always kind of looking like buttons because also the way that parts are kind of manufactured discreetly and the designer is often not involved in designing the electronics. So this kind of division of labor. And then construction kits are also kind of built on this idea that they're, they're there so that you can iterate and, and try out stuff, um, but also they're not intended to become part of the final form. And then thinking about how craft is a process where you're really trying to engage with the material um, to work it into its final form, and so combining uh, th these processes and materials to build uh, this in this kit of no parts. So just some images to show, again, this process of exploring, um, so using gold leaf uh, to try to make conductive connections, um, carving, uh, so first painting a wood with a conductive paint and then carving a way to create circuitry, um, or casting, or being able to apply circuitry to existing objects, such as seashells, or sculpting something, and then uh, <coughs> applying it, so th more three-dimensional circuitry. And then yeah, here are just some more examples. And one of the more detailed explorations I did, but that's going to come in another slide. So again, uh, this process of kind of documenting little bits and uh, kind of preparing it to be shared and again a website to do so and this time I was when I designed the website I really wanted it to be kind of like a library where you could come at it from different angles you could be like I want to paint a circuit so then you could click on the recipes category under crafts and painting and you would find everything that was really that could be painted on the other hand you could say I need I want some kind of output so I need to actuate something. Then you could click on the actuator category and you would get uh, something. So like here, someone clicked on the actuator category and then they said, I want to make a speaker. And then by clicking on the speaker, they also they yeah, ended up on this kind of tutorial to making paper speakers. And maybe another good thing to say is not all the... I'm also, of course, inspired by other people's work. So I, I also, uh, first thing I try to do is always reference where I'm getting my uh, knowledge and inspiration from. So these speakers were uh, inspired by work from Marcelo Coelho and Vincent Leclerc. Yeah, uh, the work. So they had, public, they had done projects with it before, but I really couldn't find very good documentation. 
about exactly what materials they had used, how they had amplified the signal, how they, what, what had influenced their design decisions in their project. Um, so for me, a lot of the work was to kind of reverse engineer from what little documentation I and with talking with them, and then prepare that documentation to kind of be shared again. And again, kind of making little demos. So basically the idea is that you don't have to wrap wire around a cylinder to make an electromagnet. You can also make a, a spiral into the surface. Doesn't sound that good. <laughs> but this is using copper tape on a piece of uh, thin veneer wood. And that's just a little magnet. So the way a speaker works is you have an electromagnet with the audio signal going through and then you have a permanent magnet um, and so the electromagnet is uh, attracted and repelled which moves the membrane which is the material that it's mounted on so this is tissue paper And then this is a version with a conductive fabric that's laser cut and then fused onto some uh, canvas fabric. And the audio is coming from a quite a bad sound source. It's actually a greeting card. This is gold leaf on a plastic foil. But I just hacked out like a sound circuit from a greeting card that plays the same song over and over again. And this was conductive paint. No, this is still the gold leaf. Yep. And then also trying out different shapes. But so, again, showing a bit of the documentation of the speaker. And then, again, for this talk, I went online and I looked around a bit to see what work I could find. Um, and this is a project done by uh, Jess Rawland uh, with people at CINMAT, so the Center for New Music Technologies at Berkeley. And she, this, I find very nice work. So first of all, they... I think we're inspired just simply by the fact that I was looking at making speakers in a plane with paper and copper tape. But they looked at the design and it doesn't have to be a spiral anymore, it can be a kind of a repetitive, uh, so creating uh, loops to uh, create kind of a, a magnetic field, stronger magnetic field. And so then some geometric patterns, but then also very abstract kind of, uh, almost like drawings and just integrating this kind of shapes into it. And then I think she's a composer musician and so she's made these panels that are covered in these copper kind of speaker drawings and um, she performs through them as the audio source. Um, and then this is a project by uh, Carla and Pien, uh, at V2 in the Netherlands. And they also were uh, inspired by the paper speakers and tried to translate it into knitting and found that they don't even have to try to create a coil shape at all, basically just by creating uh, lines of the way the, the wire, so an insulated wire, how it loops around and creates like a, lots of little magnetic fields that probably somehow merge together to create a, a knit speaker. And then she made a little hoodie scarf with the speakers in the ears, so kind of like headphones. And then this was something I thought was just nice because it was on Instructables again, but someone actually posted back on the paper speaker Instructable that they had also made their own pair. Doesn't sound that great, but it worked for them. And then just to kind of uh, finish off my presentation, I also wanted to say that it's very nice to be able to um, interact with uh, the community um, and feel like there, it's a back, it, a back and forth. I'm also now inspired by seeing other people's projects with you know, related work. And, uh, but I also do a lot of workshops, so it's also nice to meet people in person and sit down together and make things together. So that, um, in the workshops too, you get to see a lot of ideas that people come up with, what they would want to do with these uh, textile electronics. Um, and yeah, so just some images of these from the workshops. Yeah, thank you.
Hi, Hannah. Hello. Uh, I knew your work uh, because of the crying dress, and uh, I was really obsessed with this work during many days, uh, asking to myself if then you can push further within the fashion industry this type of researches in uh, any way. Mm -hmm. I don't know, when I think about um, market and wearables, it comes to me Stella McCartney and Adidas, for example, this type of combinations. But I think that this type of approach, it's uh, much more interesting, uh, much more collaborative. I think that it came uh, yeah, with other different types of approaches of how textile and electronics can uh, uh, interact in new type of markets, but still it's like quite difficult for me to understand uh, how can you push further this type of, of, of prototypes uh, to start new lines of, of um, I don't know, researches that they can, they can insert within the, the, the real industry. This mm -hmm. is one question. Uh, and the other one is um, for you, which is the, the main fact that, uh, the main important fact that technology has at, as a value to, to fashion? Um, good questions. Uh, the, the first one, so what would have to happen for these kinds of technologies to come more to market? I think there is a lot of work being done, but again, from my point of view, it, a lot of it is going back to how can we kind of standardize and make all these electronics very robust and or in, in order to make them robust they often kind of go back to traditional ways of like um, integrating and, and it's a lot of it's integrating traditional components into kind of soft materials um, and I think that is happening slowly in academics and in industry. I know that Philips has brought out like a, a medical pad called Blue, blue touch and it, you wear it on your back and the blue light um, helps against back pain. Um, but they've been soldering LEDs onto uh, woven materials and yes, and their challenge has been how do they mass produce, how do they uh, set up a, a workflow for making like a lot of LEDs on woven fabric. Um, and what's nice from my perspective is that you don't have to consider mass production, you're, you're very free and all the different possibilities that you can uh, come up with ways of making things because you don't have to make a lot of them so you can do it by hand or you can yeah um, and then with the fashion industry what technology has brought to the fashion industry I'm not since I'm not involved in fashion so much myself but I asked, was asked that question before once and I think what I thought was maybe more interesting is what fashion might be bringing to technology would be uh, to think a bit more about materiality and aesthetics in electronics and to get away from all these plastics and um, black, gray, silver colors. Thank you. 